Last new material for the term. Yay. Oh, and then no more next week, <laughs> except for the exam. Uh, the, I will be around next week, Monday and Tuesday, so if people would like to try and schedule some extra office hours, please send me an email, um, let me know. I suspect there will be some interest. I don't know what the rest of your final schedules look like. <coughs> so without further ado, let's <coughs> start our clicker questions. Nice long one here. Um, your TA forgot to put beta mercaptoethanol, darn TA, in the SDS mixture that you use for SDS page in the lab. You see one large band on the SDS page shell. You repeat the experiment with BME and observe one band about half the size of the band in the first experiment. What's the best explanation for this? Your protein is a homodimer, protein is a heterodimer, protein is degraded, the SDS did not work, the beta mercaptoethanol did not work. And we'll probably do a double length one for this, yes? <laughs> Quadruple, quintuple, whole class section. So we're going to do another round? Yes? Yes, please. OK. So we'll just start again when it lets me. OK, same question. Ten. Five. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what does beta mercaptoethanol do? No idea. What does beta mercaptoethanol do? Beta mercaptoethanol will reduce your disulfide bond. So if you get a disulfide bond binding two things to each other, that's what beta mercaptoethanol does. So it will break that bond. So if you've broken a bond, what does that mean about what you might have had to start with? If you didn't put in BME, what will happen? Anything that's bonded together with the disulfide is going to be big, right? So you put in the beta mercaptoethanol because your TA didn't do it right. Uh, and those two pieces now come apart. If they were going to be one band on SDS page, what does that mean? Both of those pieces are about the same size, right? If they're running as one band on SDS page, that's the whole point of SDS page. You're separating based on size, right? So what does that mean about homo versus heterodimer? It's much more likely to be a homodimer than a heterodimer, because heterodimer is going to be different. And they might have the same size, but it's much more likely that you have them as a homodimer. 
So second question for today, <clears throat> which of the following techniques is best for determining the highest resolution structure of a protein, mass spectrometry, blast searches, x-ray crystallography, NMR spectroscopy, or SDS page? And can you talk any faster? Ten, five. Yes, it is X-ray crystallography. Uh, <clears throat> mass spectrometry is a great way for getting very precise masses, but it's almost always going to be an individual peptide, so it's not for your whole protein. Plus, it's just the mass. It tells you nothing about the structure. Blast searches are great for discovering homologs of proteins because they have similar sequences to each other. X-ray crystallography gives you the highest resolution of these techniques, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, NMR spectroscopy can give you data, but as we looked at last time, it's very often floppy. Those bare bits of your protein which are clearly not ordered, so it's not giving you a very high resolution structure. So um, the correct answer is yes, C. OK, so today we'll talk a little bit more about protein methods, but mostly concentrate on DNA methods. Um, and it turns out DNA methods are way easier than protein methods. Uh, and for a long time, DNA was harder, but now uh, protein methods are a lot easier. So we'll really briefly cover structure. One of the things that I didn't have on that last slide and I mentioned really briefly last time is that there's another method that people are using for getting high resolution structures of proteins, and that is electron microscopy. And we'll take a quick look at that, a nice example here in just a second. Talk briefly about some protein-protein interaction techniques and then really move on to DNA. And the main thing I really want to talk about today is DNA sequencing. Um, we'll, we will get there, I promise. <laughs> but first, um, just wanted to give you this example of what more and more people and more and more researchers are doing these days in determining high resolution structures. This is the first structure of mammalian RNA polymerase II at very high resolution. This is about as good as you're going to get with most X-ray structures, 3.4 angstrom resolution. And I mentioned electron density last time. Um, this is what you get out of your X-ray crystal structure. Basically, what's this gray thing is here on the outside, and then you build your model from the sequence that you know and see how well it fits into this particular model. And so here's a nice example here. Here's a leucine. Here's a tyrosine. We see the gray, and then you can fit a particular amino acid into it. This is also really nice because this one also has RNA in the structure. So it's another way of doing high resolution structure, and more and more people are using cryo-EM. Um, we can talk more about the cryo-EM later on. Just another technique that people use. So briefly, last couple things I wanted to talk about in terms of protein techniques, protein analysis techniques. A lot of the time you're interested in not just what a protein does, but what it's interacting with. And we talked about the chromatin immunoprecipitation way back when um, in terms of what DNA a protein's interacting with, but very often it's protein-protein interactions that are really important, say for co-activators, et cetera. So how can you detect these? There's this really neat <clears throat> technique called the two-hybrid screen, horrible name, but that's what everybody calls it, where it takes advantage of the fact that DNA 
binding proteins, particularly activator proteins, are modular. So you've got a DNA binding domain and an activation domain, which are really separate relative to each other. And so <clears throat> what people do is they'll take the DNA binding domain of one particular transcriptional regulator and fuse it to whatever protein they're interested in, say A in this case. And then what they'll do is they'll take a whole bunch of other proteins and fuse them to an activation region. And the only way you're going to get activation of this gene is if A and B interact with each other. And so you go through, in this case, it's not just B, but it's C, D, E, F, G, et cetera. And so in this case, B interacts with A, you have transcription that takes place just through this protein-protein interaction. And this is how people found a lot of the coactivator genes, et cetera. So it's a DNA binding domain that otherwise is not going to activate. So that's your one fusion, one of your two hybrids. The second one is a activation domain connected to something that you think might be interacting with A. You put these two together. If you see transcription, that means that they're interacting with each other. So that's one kind of protein-protein interaction assay. Another kind that people very often use are what are also called pull-down assays. We talked about chromatin immunoprecipitation. The precipitation part of that is binding your antibody to something which will cause precipitation to take place. Here, what's causing precipitation is this gray thing right here. So the gray thing right here is a bead. It's big. On it, it has <clears throat> a particular molecule that one of your proteins is going to interact with. And so here, it's the glutathione S transferase. Again, it's not important exactly what that protein is. It's going to bind to this bead and allow precipitation to take place. Now what you do is you fuse through genetic engineering techniques that we'll talk about towards the end today, um, this binding protein to whatever protein you're interested in binding to something else. So a great example here would be something like the Tata binding protein, TBP. So TBP attached to GST. You put this together with your beads, and then you throw in a cell extract and see what is still interacting with these beads. These would be all the other proteins that are in your TF2D complex, for instance. So this process, you know what this protein is going to bind to. You use this to separate the protein you're interested in from all the other proteins except for the ones that are bound to it. So this is a way of looking at protein-protein interactions. In this case, it's just looking at protein-protein interactions in a in vitro setting, so without cells, just a cell extract mixture of proteins. The previous one was looking at what happens inside the cell. Yes? Where do you get the big gray blob here? The big gray blob here is, is a, usually some kind of bead, just something which is really big and allows you to separate what is bound to it from everything else. And usually that consists of mixing things together in a little test tube and then letting stuff go to the bottom. The stuff that's big is going to go to the bottom. Or in some cases, you also have a magnet, and that's a magnetic bead. And so you use a magnet, you put the magnet next to the tube, and everything that binds to that, you go to the side, everything else is left. So lots of different ways of doing it. Yeah? Uh, two things. So does this pull down method only in vitro, or just that this example that you have shown is in vitro? So this particular one is just in vitro, because yeah, how do you have a bead? How do you get a magnetic bead inside a cell? I didn't know if it was in <laughs> Oh, yeah, no. This one. You, this is all happening inside the cell. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, you were comparing it to the um, immunoprecipitant one. Yeah. So are the molecules on this bead, are they also antibodies or are they not? Or could they be? So the question basically is I'm comparing us to um, the chromatin immunoprecipitation. And are these antibodies or antibody antigen interactions? In this particular case, no, but you can certainly use antibodies for something like this as well. And in fact, many people do. Um, would also be called a co-immunoprecipitation, which would be using this. OK, so that's protein methods. Again, last time we talked about centrifugation, either large scale for preparative or analysis, either through equilibrium or sedimentation. Chromatography, 
Well, it's a different ones, but the main ones we talked about are ion exchange, gel filtration, and affinity chromatography. And basically, all that this is is having something in a column which will either slow down or bind to your protein and have everything else come off of that column. Electrophoresis, SDS page. We covered that a little bit in our question today. Um, two dimensional gels are isoelectric focusing followed by SDS page. And so you're separating based on charge and based on the relative molecular mass. There's a little bit about mass spectrometry. Again, this is getting very high precision data on peptides. It's a really good way of identifying proteins, particularly on things like two dimensional gels. X ray crystallography and NMR spectroscopy for doing this kind of. <clears throat> Structural analysis, the bioinformatics here, blast searches is only a very, very, very small part of computational biology, but it's the one that's probably most often used. And then we just covered some protein-protein interactions. Any questions about the protein stuff at this point before we move on and talk about DNA? Okay, so <clears throat> basically the processes which we just talked about are all about the protein, and this is figuring out what that protein does, you've got to purify the protein, et cetera. Once you have a purified protein, if you don't know what its sequence is, you can use mass spec, figure out what the DNA is, get a whole bunch of that DNA, and we'll talk about how that process works in just a second. Um, if you have the DNA, which is usually the case these days because most things are in databases, then you can take this particular DNA and make a whole bunch of the protein that's coded for by this DNA. And we'll talk about that process um, as well. So again, what we're going to talk about, slightly moved around a little bit, we're going to talk about restriction endonucleases first, then gel electrophoresis, a little bit about probes. Probes are a way of detecting your DNA because you can't see DNA any other way. So probes are a really important way of doing this detection. Um, blots, we talked a little bit about the Western blots last time. We'll talk more about blots as well here. Basically, blot is making a copy of something which you have separated and then use that with a probe to detect what you're looking for. Recombinant DNA is all about restriction endonucleases and vectors. A vector is just a way of moving your particular piece of DNA around. Very often, people have libraries. It's just a mixture of all of the DNA or copies of RNA that you have in any particular cell at any particular time. PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, hopefully everyone's heard about PCR. Everyone can answer PCR questions on exams. We're not awake. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about the polymerase chain reaction. Um, really amazing process. If people are interested in the guy who discovered this is completely nuts, um, we can talk about that offline. Um, and then DNA sequencing, and this is really where the huge progress has been made literally in the last 10 years. The one example we'll talk about, the massively parallel sequencing, was originally developed 11 years ago. Um, and it's just completely revolutionized how we think about biology and these other kinds of things. And we'll see how we get with some of the rest of it. But I want to start with restriction endonucleases. Um, in the book, they talk about restriction nucleases. They're actually endonucleases, so they're not chopping at the ends, they're chopping in the middle of DNA. So these are very specific DNA binding proteins that will bind to and cut a very specific DNA sequence. Many cases, they are palindromic sequences, which means that they have the same sequence in opposite orientations and opposite strands. So here, 5 prime GAA TTC. On the other strand, 5 prime GAA TTC. Not surprisingly, being symmetric, almost all of these are also going to bind as dimers. What do they do? They bind to this sequence and chop it, cut it apart, usually leaving these overlapping ends, which will turn out to be extremely useful later on. Lots of bacteria have these restriction endonucleases in them. This is a little bit strange. Why are you going to express lots of endonucleases inside your cell? We've talked about endonucleases quite a bit. Double-stranded breaks, really nasty. Um, all kinds of problems happen if you have double-stranded breaks. So the cell has to have a way of protecting itself from cutting its own DNA. And the way that works is they have methylation. And this is, in fact, exactly the same methylation that most bacteria use for licensing when you have 
hemimethylation that happens right after your replication. That methylation is protecting the DNA from the restriction endonucleases. Why would you want to have one of these restriction endonucleases? It's because most viruses that infect bacteria are double-stranded DNA. So if a viral DNA comes inside the cell, you have a restriction endonuclease, it will chop up that viral DNA. And so you don't have to worry about it. Well, you just have to make sure that your own DNA is protected. And so the methylation that normally happens in bacteria um, are here at the <coughs> N6 position of adenosine or N, uh, sorry, <coughs> or the C5 position of cytosine, and I basically just show that here to emphasize that it does nothing to do with your base pairing interactions. So base pairing interactions are perfectly fine, but you're changing what's going on in the major group of DNA, so now your restriction endonuclease can't come down and bind it. Um, this is the way that an older version of our textbook used, but basically it's the same thing here. You've got all of these restriction endonucleases that can cut usually these palindromic sequences, again, here, GTTAAC, opposite strand, GTTAAC. Turns out that these restriction endonucleases can cut in lots of different ways. You can either cut both strands at the same place, right opposite each other. That's what's called a blunt cut. You can cut both strands in such a way that you have this end here sticking out. This is going to be a five prime end here. Um, your five prime end over here, so it's got a five prime overhang, or it can be the other way around where you have a three prime overhang. In the book, they mentioned four to eight base pair recognition sequences. Turns out there are lots more, not terribly surprisingly. And a number of companies have been formed to sell these because they're incredibly useful. And this place um, called New England Biolabs is probably the best known, one of the very first ones to start doing this. Um, has a great database on all these different restriction endonucleases. I think they've got something like 500 different ones here. So they all cut slightly different sequences um, and are extremely useful for recombinant DNA techniques. So why are they useful and why did people start looking at them in the first place? Well, the main one actually had to do with analyzing DNA because DNA generally was too big to be able to analyze directly, so you had to cut it into smaller pieces. And that's what people first started using these restriction endonucleases for. Um, here's a big double-stranded piece of DNA, which you can cut with one or the other of these restriction endonucleases, and then you want to see how big that particular piece of DNA is. How do you figure out how big something is. Well, you separate things on gels. So not unlike what's going on. You can collect that later. <laughs> um, it looks like a nitrogen atom, actually, I think. Um, so <clears throat> there are a couple of different ways that people have figured out how to separate different sized pieces of DNA. The most commonly used are agarose, which is from seaweed, but it's a nice polysaccharide that is liquid at some temperatures, high enough temperatures, you cool it down, it forms a nice gel. Uh, that's this example, which we have here in the middle, agarose gel. Same thing as you do with SDS page. You set up an electric field from negative to positive. One of the great things about DNA, of course, it's got a nice uniform negative charge, and so it will be separated going from negative to positive. Yeah? On the prior page, this looks yep. like E4R and... Echo R1, by the way. Yes? Mm -hmm. oh. Sorry. Pin D3? Pin D3, uh, all of those pieces, that's the same. Just the ah. itself. So um, the, here, so that's a great, great question, by the way. Um, and I should have emphasized this a little bit more. So this is um, echo, not surprisingly, is from E. coli. And hin is from Haemophilus influenza. So the first three letters always stand for the species of the bacteria. Um, and this is restriction endonuclease 1. Turns out there are about six different restriction endonucleases in E. coli. So um, echo R1 is going to bind to GAATTC. Hindi 3 binds to AAGCTT. So it binds to different sequences. Okay, so it's not just sequence, it's like the exact same one. They are going to cut and give you four base overhangs um, in this particular case. And many of the restriction in the nucleases do this. Um, we'll give you four base overhangs. And probably the majority are going to be five with five prime overhangs. But there are some that will give you three prime overhangs and some that will give you a blunt cut. 
And we'll see why that's extremely useful a little bit later on when we talk about the recombinant DNA. Yeah? Uh, these numbers below, say, aggro, backslash. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Are those just uh, number of base pairs? Oh, so I have. Thank you. Just about to talk about that. <laughs> so, um, yes. So, <clears throat> this is the example here is just looking at an agarose gel. Um, with agarose gels, you can separate between 500 and about 10,000 nucleotides which is great, it's a really easy way for doing things. Um, and most of the DNAs that you're going to be looking at, by the time you've cut them with these restriction endonucleases, they'll give you on the order of 1,000 base pair size pieces. So very often when you've done a restriction endonuclease digestion, digestion is just cutting it up, you'll have pieces that are about these kinds of sizes. And so agarose gel electrophoresis is by far and away the most commonly used one I'm going to be using it in the lab a ton next term in the mutant viruses from hell um, class. So that's what standard resolution is with agarose. Again, this is the polysaccharide from seaweed. If you need to get higher resolution, then you actually go to acrylamide, which is exactly the same material that's used for SDS page. The PA for page is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Um, with polyacrylamide, you can separate from 10 to 500 nucleotides in length, but the resolution here is literally per base. And so this piece right here is one base pair longer than this piece, which is one base longer than this piece, which is one base longer than this piece. Actually, it's the other way around. This one's longer than this one, which is longer than that one, longer than this one. Smaller ones down here, bigger ones up here at the top. Uh, so these are what you're using for these smaller pieces of DNA. A couple of very smart people came up with this other method where you can separate really, really big pieces of DNA. Um, this is called pulse field gel electrophoresis. Also uses agarose, but it plays around with the electric field. Um, changes it from top to bottom, et cetera. Um, really cool looking apparatuses for separating things. How that actually works is not really critical. Uh, so you can separate them on these gels. The problem is, how do you detect the DNA that you've separated on these gels? Because it's not obviously visible. One way is to incorporate radioactivity into your DNA, and that's usually what's done in these acrylamide gels. But for agarose gels, that works, but it's you know, a lot of radioactivity when you're um, looking at this. So what most people use are these dyes, which are fluorescent dyes. Ethidium bromide is the best known of these. What ethidium bromide does is it binds to double-stranded DNA and fluoresces. When it's not bound to double-stranded DNA, it doesn't fluoresce. When it does bind to double-stranded DNA, it fluoresces. And I had a wonderful talk from the guy who founded Genentech, Herb Boyer, um, who tells of when he first saw this happen. He saw that someone had taken this you know, DNA gel and separated things and stained it with ethidium bromide. Uh, ethidium bromide uh, will emit in the visual, but you have to excite it in the UV. And so you have a UV box. A lot of people have probably seen these UV boxes with a little UV light. Shine it on the gel, and then you get this emission. This is what these bands um, come from. Um, the problem is most people didn't realize that they would get really nasty sunburns if they looked at their gels for too long. Um, so you, know, you walk around various different like the biology departments, see people with these you know, really bright faces. It's not because they were skiing. They were looking at their gels for a little bit too long. I did that too. Um, so um, this is your electrophoresis. So detecting just in general straight radioactivity, relabeling everything, or one of these stains which will fluoresce. However, a lot of the time you want to get a very specific DNA that has some kind of way you can detect it. And that's what's called this the probe technique. There are really kind of two different ways of making probes. I'll talk about the second one first. Uh, the Second one is what's called end labeling. And so end labeling is just like what it sounds. You put a label of some kind on the end, and there are two different ways that you can do that. Not surprisingly, what kind of two different ends do you have on a DNA? Five prime and three prime. So polynucleotide kinase, what do kinases do? They put phosphates on things. What do they put them on? Polynucleotides. So this particular enzyme will put a phosphate on the 5' prime end of your DNA. If you have radioactive phosphate that you use for that, it will put a radioactive phosphate at the 5' prime end of your DNA. And so that's this example right here. Polynucleotide kinase puts a 
phosphate on both of the five prime ends of your DNA. You're usually only going to want one of them. And so you take your double-stranded DNA, you cut it with your favorite restriction endonuclease, and you'll have a big piece and a small piece, and you know because you know the sequence which one of these you particularly want. So you can basically do exactly the same thing as a three prime end using this enzyme called terminal transferase that will just label the three prime end. So if you want the three prime end, you use one, five prime end, you use the other. What most people use these days for labeling is what's called body labeling. And all this is, is it takes advantage of the fact that DNA polymerases are kind of dumb. Uh, they will take anything that's got the right base pairing interaction and include anything that you happen to have hanged off the back end of that particular nucleotide. Um, usually, at least in the good old highly radioactive days, um, you're using radioactive nucleotides. Now people are very often using non-radioactive things that we'll take a look at in just a second on the next slide. So the basic idea here is you have your double-stranded piece of DNA, you pull it apart, you either use specific primers, because all DNA polymerases have to have primers, or <clears throat> you can have non-specific primers. These are what are called random hexamers. So they're just any six different nucleotides which can bind randomly to your DNA. And then just use a DNA polymerase to extend these. So this works fine if you can pull your two strands apart, because of course your DNA polymerase is going to have to have a template. On the other hand, what does DNA polymerase 1 do that none of the other polymerases do? Choose forwards. So it has a what kind of exonuclease? So it's got 5 prime to 3 prime and 3 prime to 5 prime. So proofreading and cutting ahead of it. So what that means is you can actually take a double-stranded piece of DNA like this, make a tiny little break in it, and then throw in DNA polymerase 1 with your labeled nucleotides, and it will take this little break, or the nick in one strand, and extend that. And that's what's called nick translation. So you take your DNA polymerase 1, mix it together with this fragment with labeled nucleotides, you'll get a labeled piece here. So there are two different ways of doing this. Uh, Classically, it's been DNA polymerase 1, but you can also use hexamer primers if you pull the two strands apart. Again, mostly people used to use, and some of us old school people still do use radioactivity. Um, radioactivity is great. We can talk about why that is in just a second. But some people don't like radioactivity. So um, there's a lot of other kinds of ways that you can use to detect your DNA. And this gets back to my point about the DNA polymerases being not very selective about what kinds of nucleotides they use as long as you have your nucleotide triphosphate here, something to base pair here. You can hang all kinds of other stuff off of these individual nucleotides. And usually this extra stuff is a way that you can now detect whatever DNA this is that this nucleotide has been incorporated into. Um, digoxygenin is a <clears throat> toxin. There's some really good antibodies to digoxygenin. You can use biotin, which binds to avidin really well. So it's just another way of detecting a very specific DNA fragment. Why do we care about detecting specific DNA fragments? That's because DNA is wonderful, just like RNA, at finding its complementary sequence. So you can pull DNA. We talked about this before. You can pull the two D DNA strands apart, put them back together. If you've got a specific probe that's got a label on it that's now going to be complementary to one particular sequence, you can now label that particular sequence and pull it out from everything else which happens to be there. So DNA hybridizes to DNA, DNA hybridizes to RNA, RNA hybridizes to RNA, etc. All of these different possibilities. So uh, this is how you get your probe to the right place. But how do you separate your DNA and get the probe to that DNA? That's the process called blotting. And all that blotting really is is making a copy of something that you've separated and putting it onto a membrane. And there are two reasons for that. One, so you can get your probe onto it. Because if it's a gel, it's usually something which is pretty thick. In the case of an agarose gel, anything between half a centimeter and a centimeter. The other thing is, even if you are polyacrylamide gels, which are much thinner, you've still got to get your probe to it. It's a lot better if you have now your DNA stuck on a surface. And how you get that to happen, 
You separate your nucleotides on some kind of gel. Again, usually this is going to be an agarose gel. And basically you transfer this to a membrane. The way this normally happens, you build this nice little sandwich and you can't find any paper towels in the bathrooms of molecular biology labs because they've stolen them all to make these blots with. Um, those will, through capillary action, basically pull your nucleic acids out of the gel and onto this membrane. The membrane will now bind specifically to nucleic acids, usually because it's got a particular charge. What kind of charge is it likely to have? Positive, because your nucleic acids are negative. And then you mix together this blot with your probe and then detect that probe somehow with the antibodies if we're talking about the non-radioactive or with x-ray film if we're talking about radioactivity. This process, hybridization, again, it's your probe together with all of these different DNAs. You're trying to identify the ones which match whatever your probe is. Lots of different kinds of blots you can use. If you're separating RNA, this is called a northern blot. If you're separating DNA, it's called a southern blot. Um, the reason it's called a southern blot, it was actually invented by a guy called Southern. And then all the other ones were named based on that name. So um, we talked about western blots really briefly. A western blot is when you have protein on your membrane. So western blot, proteins on the membrane. Northern blots, RNA on the membrane. Southern blots have DNA on the membrane. What's eastern? Um, there actually aren't any eastern blots, curiously enough. So, so, that, so I'm being called out on this. I don't know of any eastern blots. Um, they're certainly nowhere near as common as the northern, southerns, and westerns. Um, some people have combined these things. So you can have a southwestern blot. <laughs> southwestern blots are going to be doing what? Protein. DNA proteins. So DNA protein interactions. So you have a protein. You've separated your proteins. You put it onto a blot. How do you detect it? You put it labeled DNA. So, um, so southwestern blots. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not. That's <laughs> um, certainly. I I did something called a far western blot. Um, we have protein protein interactions interacting on the surface. So, you know, lots of different ways of doing this. But the main ones, and anything that would be on an exam, because I don't know about eastern blots, and I will forget that I heard anything about eastern blots, um, <laughs> would be northern, southerns, and westerns. OK, so this is how you can identify that one particular DNA that you're interested in because it's complementary to whatever probe you have. Well, why do you care? Why would you want to do this in the first place? Um, very often, it's because you're trying to find one particular gene that <clears throat> is complementary to your probe. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, one of the reasons to do this is you want to have that particular gene that you're going to want to make the protein from, for instance. So <clears throat> how do you find these things? Um, very often, these are in what are called libraries. Um, and no, it's not a library like that big building on the far side of the park blocks. But basically, the idea there is that every piece of your genome is in one separate book. So the idea here is that you've got a whole bunch of books, and every different gene or every little piece of, amino of nucleotides is in one little separate piece. How do you do that? You have your genome, you chop it up with your favorite restriction endonuclease, and then you take each of these pieces and you make them basically into a book. You put covers on the outside, and those covers are the vector. Usually these are plasmids. These are small, round pieces of DNA, or I should say circular pieces of DNA, um, which were originally found in bacteria, but we have figured out exactly how to use them. Um, that's how Herb Boyer, the fellow who met a sunburn when he was looking at the DNA gels, um, basically made millions of dollars, um, was by figuring out how these plasmids worked. Uh, so these yellow pieces, then you take the random bits of DNA, and then what you do is you want to separate all of these things from each other. They're not very useful if they're in one big humongous mixture. It's a lot better if they're all separated into individual books. If you took all the pages from all the books and mixed them up and threw them on the ground in the library, that would not be very useful. Um, however, if you have them in books, then you can separate all of them relative to each other. The problem is all the books look exactly the same. 
And so how do you figure out which of the books is the one you want? Then you do the blot. And that way you can have a probe that you can then figure out which one of these bacteria, and each of these bacteria can make many more of the same bacteria with the same DNA in it. That way you can have a whole set of books, a whole set of bacteria, each of which is going to have a different DNA in it, and one or potentially multiple of those will have the DNA that you're looking for. Yeah? So this particular case is human DNA shoved into plasmids. You can do this with any genomic DNA. You could have mouse DNA here. You could have sulfalobus DNA. You could have E. coli DNA that you separated out into little pieces. So the collection of plasmids is a library. So it's all of those plasmids together. And if you have the right kind of library, you have every single piece of that genome in a plasmid, and each of those plasmids is separate relative to each other. And in fact, you can buy these things because they're a pain in the neck to make. Uh, and it's a lot easier to make sure that you've got one, you've got the gene that you're interested in is in that library somewhere. You just need to pull it out. And that's where we get from the probes. Yeah? Uh, so how do you know both about what just happened to piece of genome? Do you know exactly what that is so that you can get it? It is extra. So the, the question is, what's a piece of genome? A piece of genome is what's between the two restriction endonuclease sites that you made to chop it out with. Okay. So it's literally a piece of DNA. Um, and you need to figure out which one you want. Again, that's the, the process of doing your hybridization, usually, to try and find it. OK, so this is great. Oh, sorry. Does that mean that you can have different versions of the library if you use different restriction endonuclease? Yeah, so this is a great point here. So can you have different versions of the library if you have different endonucleases? Yes, exactly. So you could have an ECHOR1 human genome library. You could have a Hindi 3 human genome library. And that's exactly how you would order these things. Um, great question. So um, that's great if you care about the genome. If, however, you care about what RNAs, what's being made into your RNAs, particularly if you're looking at eukaryotic genomes, you've got all these exons, you've got all these introns. Uh, how do you know what's an exon, what's an intron? Really hard to tell just from looking at the sequence. It's much better if you can get the RNA and then make a DNA copy of the RNA. And this is what's called a complementary DNA. It's just making a DNA copy from your RNA. Fortunately, we found out something about viruses. And viruses have these wonderful enzymes called reverse transcriptases, which take RNA and make a DNA copy from them. So we take advantage of that. We use reverse transcriptase. We use a poly-T primer. Why poly-T? Because it's going to base pair to your poly-A tail. And this is really nice because it's not only going to amplify whatever RNAs have poly-A tails on them. And their reverse transcriptase will extend, make a DNA copy. RNAs H you either put in separately or many of these reverse transcriptases have their own RNAs H that comes with them, degrades the RNA. Now you have an RNA primer, which will extend this. Um, what happens is this little piece is actually lost. So just like you have the case with telomeres at the end of your genomes, um, this is an extra piece. You don't have telomerase in here. So you lose a little bit of your 5 prime ends when you do this. But usually you've got enough here. And these are your different coding sequences. If you do this with all of the messenger RNA that you have in one particular place, say brain, you'll have, if your library is good, copies of all of the messenger RNAs that are being made um, in that brain when you happen to have isolated the RNA from it. So these are two different, two different kinds of libraries. Same piece of DNA here. This is your genomic library, which you just cut up with restriction endonuclease. Take your pick which one. Uh, and here, your cDNA library, which will have just copies of each of those already spliced and processed messenger RNAs. So two kinds of libraries. Just depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do a, ge a genome sequence of a whole genome, this is the way you got to go. If, however, you're interested in what genes are being expressed in any particular cell, cell type, tissue, condition, um, this is the way to go. So now we've got our libraries. We've figured out what gene we want in them. Now 
really importantly, we want to try and potentially make a whole bunch of copies of that gene or make the protein that that gene codes for. So now we go back to our restriction endonucleases, which we kind of talked about already. You take your favorite piece of DNA, you cut it with a restriction endonuclease, you cut a second piece of DNA with either the same restriction endonuclease, or one of the really fascinating things that you can do is this only depends on what this overlap sequence here is at the end. So you can actually have two different restriction endonucleases as long as they have this same compatible end here. You can use whatever restriction endonuclease you want. This is now only going to bind to this one right here because that's the only one which has an appropriate compatible end. Once you put these two together, you add DNA ligase, which will hook up these things two together, and you end up with a recombinant DNA molecule. So all that recombinant DNA molecules are, are taking two DNAs from different sources and mixing them together. That's all that recombinant DNA is. Usually, you're doing this with a vector, like one of these plasmids, and your favorite piece of DNA that you want to put into this plasmid. This is exactly the process that's used for making those genomic DNA libraries. Uh, part of that is because you're trying to find one particular piece of DNA. You want to either make a whole bunch of that particular DNA, or this is just making the library in the first place. You can, in fact, see this. This is our super duper wonderful color EM. No, actually, it's just false colored here. Uh, but you can look at DNA fragments here. This is your plasmid. Here's your extra piece of DNA, which has been colored. After it's been ligated, um, you have a nice circular piece of DNA. Why circular? This now has an origin of replication on it, so you can make many, many copies of this. Just the DNA by itself is not useful. You have to put it into something which will make more of that DNA. Um, it's almost always going to be bacteria. Take this plasmid, put it into bacteria. It's what's called transforming. Taking the plasmid, putting it into the bacterium. Um, it's actually kind of a difficult step to do. Um, again, a really important part of the whole recombinant DNA revolution. How do you know that you have a bacteria that has this DNA in it relative to this cell that doesn't? This transformation process is really inefficient. Usually, this plasmid will have something which says, hey, this cell has a plasmid in it. This one doesn't. You get an antibiotic resistance gene. And in fact, the plasmids were originally found as antibiotic resistance in bacteria that were causing diseases in hospital patients. And that's where the plasmids were originally isolated from. Once you have this plasmid in your bacterial cell, you can grow a whole bunch of it, and you end up with many, many copies of it. Why do you want many, many copies? In many cases, it's to try and make your favorite protein, because you've discovered it in a genome database, because you finally got a little bit of sequence, you did a blast search, you see that your particular gene looks like some other protein. You think it does something like that other protein, but you need to actually prove it. So you need to make some of that protein. So that is very often done with these recombinant DNA techniques. Yeah? Sorry, what's YFG? YFG, your favorite gene. <laughs> <laughs> YFP is your favorite protein. So here, YFG, our green sequence here, um, you put into a plasmid vector. And in this particular case, you have a plasmid vector that has some extra bits and pieces in it. These are particular promoter sequences. They're usually viral promoter sequences. But that promoter sequence also will have a nice ribosome binding site next to it. And when you take this plasmid, put it into cells, and turn on this promoter, you can make a whole bunch of your favorite gene. In this case, your favorite gene is the DNA helicase. Um, and then once you have lots of this, then you go through the appropriate purification process. Very often, not only will you have a promoter and a ribosome binding site here, you will also have some kind of tag so you can do affinity purification of this particular protein. So recombinant DNA used to make the plasmid in the first place and then putting in your favorite gene into here. So <clears throat> where do you get your favorite gene from in the first place? You may have gotten it from a library, but 
this crazy guy, Kerry Mullis, came up with this really cool idea um, on how you can get your favorite gene without having to go through a library, without having to spend lots of money and buy it from someone who's cut up the human genome with ECHO-R1 and separated all the plasmids from each other. Um, this is something called the polymerase chain reaction. And <clears throat> what happens here is you have your double-stranded piece of DNA. In this gray segment is your favorite gene. You take primers, which you have ordered from some company that can make DNA. Um, and these are lots of different companies all competing to try and do this. Um, each of these primers now is complementary to either the beginning of your favorite gene or the end of your favorite gene. You pull the two strands apart. The way you do that is just by heating them up. Cool it down slightly. The primers will anneal. Now you've got a primer, a template, put in DNA polymerase, and your nucleotides, that primer will be extended. One of the things to notice here is that this is actually extended beyond where the end of your favorite gene is. Same thing is true here. It's extended beyond where the product of your favorite gene is here. The great thing about this polymerase chain reaction is you take these guys, you do exactly the same thing again and again and again. Um, through that process, and it's actually only after the third cycle, now you start to amplify pieces of DNA that are just the right size. And if you do this enough times, 25 to 30 times, you end up with a exponential expansion of just the DNA piece that you want. The real breakthrough in terms of this polymerase chain reaction wasn't so much this invention of you know, pulling them apart, putting in the primers, and having primer extension. What was the real key to making this work? Anybody know? Anybody been to Yellowstone? Anybody heard about TAC polymerase? No one's going to answer any of my questions today? <laughs> so the real key to getting this to work is to have a DNA polymerase that doesn't denature when you denature the strands. So you heat these DNAs up to 90 plus degrees Celsius and then cool them down. The original PCR reactions, they actually added a DNA polymerase every single time after they did this. It's a real pain in the neck to actually do this. But if you have a DNA polymerase which comes from a thermophilic microbe, then now you don't have to add DNA polymerase every single time. And so that was the TAC polymerase from Thermos aquaticus from a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. So we'll finish up, oh sorry. Yeah, so the question is why do you not just get the two strands come back together and why do you have primers which come in? Um, it's because you have a vast excess of primers. Okay, so we'll finish up talking about DNA sequencing. So this is a process originally invented in the late 1970s. Again, probably before most of you were born. Eek. Um, <clears throat> but the whole idea here is making copies of the DNA that you started with and then separating each of those copies on high-resolution gel electrophoresis in order to pick apart which of these pieces corresponded to the DNA that you were making a copy from. The key to this was actually making these dideoxy ribonucleotide triphosphates. Why dideoxy? Um, dideoxy here is you're missing a 3'OH. So, Deoxyribonucleotides, of course, no 2'OH. Dideoxy, no 3'OH. No 3'OH, no extension. So if you put in this particular nucleotide, it's what's called a chain terminator. Yeah, your DNA polymerase will get to this point. It will stop. What you do is you take a very small amount of your dideoxy nucleotide, mix it together with a bunch of normal nucleotides. You're extending from the primer that you've put in to a certain position, every once in a while, when you have a T here, you're going to incorporate one of these chain terminating A's. This will, as long as you've got a small amount of this dideoxy, you'll end up with a whole set of DNAs, some of which will have stopped at this A, 
some will have stopped at this A, some will have stopped at that A, etc. Now if you do the same thing with different dideoxys, now a dideoxy T, you'll have some DNAs that stop here, some that stop here, some that stop there. All of these are now outlined down here at the bottom. This is if you dideoxy A, you've got one that's five, one that's this much longer, one that's this much longer, but all of these are now different from each other by one nucleotide. If you now take these four reactions, the dideoxy A reaction, the dideoxy T reaction, the dideoxy C reaction, and the dideoxy G reaction, separate them on a high resolution gel, those acrylamide gels that'll separate based on the individual nucleotides, you'll get one piece that ended in A here, a piece that ended in T here, a piece that ended in G here, a piece that ended in T here, C here, etc. So you can literally read the sequence A, T, G, T, <coughs> C, A, G from the bottom of this gel to the top. Now this is the complement of this DNA that you are sequencing right here. So this is the basis for pretty much all DNA sequencing techniques that are used now, is this whole idea of chain termination, stopping and having a whole population of different nucleotides with different lengths. Uh, almost nobody does four separate reactions anymore. It's really a pain. You need four lanes on your gel um, to separate these all from each other. Um, what people do these days is when, I don't know how many of you looked at sequencing reactions, usually your sequence reaction comes back and looks something like this. Um, what this is, is it's basically exactly the same thing, only instead of doing one reaction with DDA, one with DDT, one with DDG, and one with DDC, is you mix all of them together, but each of these guys has a different fluorescent tag, basically a different color that's attached to that particular nucleotide. And again, this is that big advantage that DNA polymerases can add stuff that's got extra things hanging off of the end from it. And so here, G is black, A is green, C is blue, and T is red. This is the way it would look on a normal four reactions. You can compress all of these things together. You end up with a whole stretch of just different colors. And all you need to do is read what those different colors are. The way that happens is with a laser at one end of a gel, and each of those will fluoresce in a different color. So we have T, T, C, T, A, just the different ending pieces coming off of the bottom of our gel here. So this is pretty much the way that you know, standard DNA uh, sequencing is done. We literally did this last week. Um, only it's a lot better for a company to do this than us to do it in the lab because the pieces of machinery that do this are about the size of a fridge um, and we don't have space for them in a the lab. They're also rather expensive. Um, this is in fact an old, you know, ancient now, relatively speaking, about 15, 20 years old um, DNA sequencer, but this was basically the machine that made the human genome sequence possible, um, was by taking not just one of these small gels, and one of the really nice things about these, they're in capillaries, so the really small glass tubes, is doing 96 of them at the same time. So you can do 96 of these sequencing reactions at exactly the same time. Now we're actually up to about 1,000 base pairs per run. This particular machine could do half a million base pairs a day. Um, and that's... Um, pretty amazing, you have about 210, again, these actual numbers here are not critical, but 14 sequencers could do the human genome in one year. Um, and they had literally factories, warehouses full of these things, um, doing all of these sequences. However, you'll notice it's only about 500 base pairs per run. How can you do the human genome if you're doing it 500 base pairs at a time? How many billion bases do you need to get through if just doing a haploid? Three billion, haploid is three billion. So you have to do a whole bunch of them. Now the way that that was done is by taking your DNA and instead of sequencing here, stopping, sequencing again, stopping, sequencing again, stopping, sequencing again, is people did what they call shotgun sequencing. And all that shotgun sequencing is is taking your DNAs and basically taking a shotgun to them um, and 
breaking them up in lots of different places. And then once you've broken up all of your DNAs in different places, now you can put these DNAs into your favorite plasmid vector, um, which now has known sequences at either end, so you can use primers that you know what those primers are, and just sequence all the pieces. Well, sequencing all the pieces, 500 bases a piece, which is what was originally being done, those 500 bases a piece, you've now got to try and put back together. You've got to reassemble what you broke up here in the first place. The way that's done is just by finding sequences that overlap with each other. So these are just two examples here of sequences. Here's a DNA sequence, G, T, T, C, A, G, C, A, T, T, G, that overlaps with this sequence, which has a G, T, T, C, A. You find these two that overlap with each other, you line them up, this is now reassembling what you had back up here. Now, if you think about it, again, these are 500 base pieces of 3 billion. How the heck do you get all these things put together? Uh, the answer is, it's really, really hard. Uh, and a lot of the progress that was made, not only in assembling and putting together the human genome through the sequencing technology, was also the computational technology to take these literally millions of sequences and find the pieces that overlap between all of them. So that was one process. Um, the bad guys, when we talked about the human genome, basically said they could do this for the whole human genome, just assembling them all together because their computers, you know, my computer's better than your computer. Uh, but uh, the process that was done by the Human Genome Project was a slightly different one. And so what they did is they said, okay, shotgun sequencing's great, it's wonderful, but trying to put together three billion bases, you know, again, divide that by 500, it's still a really, really big number. Uh, so we'll take slightly smaller pieces and then try and put all of those together. And so what those smaller pieces were, what are, what are called BAC, so what's a BAC? Um, again, yet another set of abbreviations to learn. Um, BAC is a bacterial artificial chromosome. Uh, and chromosomes in bacteria are usually million to 10 million bases, an artificial bacterial chromosome. It's on the order of hundreds of thousands of bases. Hundreds of thousands of bases, when you split it up into 500 base pair pieces, is relatively easy to put back together. The key here is to make sure that your bacterial artificial chromosome actually it represents what you had in your human genome to start with. So these bacterial artificial chromosomes were made by cutting the human genome with different restriction endonucleases. Most of these restriction endonucleases cut at relatively rare sequences that are present in the human genome. And then all of these BAC clones were tested against the human genome to say, okay, this back clone corresponds to this part of the human genome. This back clone here corresponds to this part of the human genome, et cetera. And then what they did, which is really, I think, an amazing international collaboration, is the people who made these back clones literally sent them all over the world to different sequencing centers. And each of those sequencing centers sequenced one of the back clones, 500 bases a piece, put them together, and then sent all that data back to one central repository where they then started to piece them all back together. And that's really how the human genome sequence was originally done. So that took, well, it depends on when you started, but decades and about a billion dollars. These days you can sequence a human genome in a day. How do you do that? Next generation sequencing. They talk about second generation sequencing in the textbook. I hate that term. Um, a lot of people use next generation sequencing, also a horrible term. Uh, basically, I like what OHSU uses, uh, massively parallel sequencing. So what's massively parallel sequencing? Massively parallel sequencing is doing a billion sequencing runs in one time. And this is technology that was pioneered by a company called Illumina. Basically, it's almost exactly like dideoxy sequencing on a capillary, only here it's done on a glass slide. So each of these little dots here of about a billion dots, represents one DNA sequence, one thing that you've split up. 
And then the colors in each of these dots represent one nucleotide that's been added, just like those different colored nucleotides that you have in capillary sequencing. Here, the real advantage that they made was that this 3 prime dideoxy is reversible. So they block here. You add one fluorescent nucleotide, gives you one color here. Then you wash everything off put in your next set of nucleotides, you get a whole set of different colors. And what you do is you just take a picture, very, very high resolution picture of this block here, and you say this particular position right here is yellow this time, it's blue next time, it's red next time. And literally you get billions of sequences this way, and then you put them into your computer, and that will align all of them back together to give you your final genome. So that's where we'll stop. It's 1121. Um, there'll be a review on Friday, a couple of clicker questions, and the exam next Wednesday, week from today.